Uh, lots of you entering the room right now. So a big welcome. I'm Sam LaPrade and we're going to get going here in a few minutes when we see uh, a few people uh, have come in the room. You're in, in for a real treat today. Alex Keenan's here, which I'm very excited about. Uh, so we're going to get her introduced and we're going to chat all about communications and outreach today. And what I love about these webinars is I get a chance to ask lots of questions, which is bonus. I love it. Um, but you also, you get to ask lots of questions. So if there's a question that's been uh, twirling around in your mind regarding communications and outreach, uh, uh, don't hesitate to write it into the Q&A and we'll make sure to get it all uh, organized and uh, an opportunity for uh, lots of questions a little bit later uh, in the webinar today. Um, you're going to get to meet uh, Hannah Rockburn a little bit as well. So we'll make sure to uh, introduce her to you. I'm not seeing where everybody's from. If you're just arriving, tell us where you're from in the chat. I love to see where you're coming from. Uh, I'm going to tell you where I'm coming from. I'm in beautiful Richmond, Ontario, uh, which is just outside Ottawa. So I'd love to see where everybody's coming from today. Uh, how is my friend Hannah today? I'm There's good. This. There we are. <laughs> There you go. Oh, Lanark, Ontario. That's lovely. I love Lanark. Ottawa is here as well. Uh, so lots of different uh, people uh, joining us today. Um, and uh, previously a Montrealer, but uh, a Trontarian right now. So that's great. Uh, look forward to uh, to meeting all of you. Definitely uh, let us know in the chat where you're coming from. I'm going to turn the mic over to our friend, Hannah Rockburn. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. It's always a pleasure. Perfect. Uh, so for those who may not uh, know me, I'm Hannah Rockford, and I'm the operations manager uh, here at the Capacity Building Institute, uh, where we provide training, coaching, and mentorship support uh, to staff, volunteers, board members in the environmental sector all across Canada. Uh, and our big mission, our vision, goal in our organization is to provide this equal opportunity and access to capacity building training and support for every nonprofit environmental leader across Canada. Um, this might be emerging leaders where it's students just graduated and looking to get into the sector, or it's maybe more seasoned leaders that are running their own nonprofits and just need some support and additional guidance uh, for running their organization or it could be board members where you're all volunteers uh, and you want to be able to make a difference and so we do training for all stages our current programming uh, so we have the capacity building certificate program so a number of you guys tonight are part of this uh, where we help train leaders uh, and give them support and coaching one-on-one uh, -on -one support for their different activities for the organization, hitting those six modules there that you see the leadership, financial, governance, communications, and outreach. We have an intern version of that. So for the emerging leaders I mentioned uh, that just are learning about the nonprofit sector. So we have that training that goes on every year from June to December. Uh, and I wanted to actually talk about a new program opportunity. And yeah, we're really excited to have this launch this fall and go into the summer of next year. Uh, where we are looking for seasoned leaders with over 25 years experience in the sector um, to either join a board for a one-year term at the environmental sector within Ottawa, um, as well as you'll be able to get some extra training resources and guidance as being a board member, and then also be able to participate in one of these training sessions, whether that be a panelist for our webinars we have monthly, or if it's more with our intern program where you can share your experience and your expertise with these emerging young leaders uh, under the age of 30 uh, to be able to share your experiences in the field or maybe your knowledge if you have a specific environmental um training of some kind that you've done, we would love for you to be able to join this. Uh, so if you are interested and in wanting to learn more about this new program, uh, please reach out to um, Nick uh, at communications at capacitybuilding.ca, uh, or you can send us um, a direct contact on our website. As always, we have our awesome lead trainers. So we have two of them tonight uh, speaking, Sam and Alex. Uh, we also have a variety of other guest speakers and trainers that have a variety of different um, strengths that would be able to help guide you uh, along with our coaches. And then I just also wanted to give a special thank out to all of our current funders uh, that are helping us with these programs, be able to reach out um, with that. So community uh, 
of Ottawa Foundation, City of Ottawa, the Sustainable Capacity Foundation, as well as Suncor. That's helping us support all of our operations. And then just to save the date. So as I mentioned, this is a monthly webinar series that we have every month. And next month on October 2nd, 4 p.m. Eastern, we'll be tackling the topic of risk management and legal issues. Uh, so that would be a great and looking forward to, for any of those questions. You can also always email us, visit our website. We do have a phone line if you would like the old fashioned phone call to speak with us in person. Uh, or if you happen to be in the Ottawa area, you can stop by our shared office space uh, and have a chat with us in person. And with that, I will pass it back over to Sam. Uh, it's great to have uh, have all that great information. We appreciate it very much. Uh, Hannah is uh, is behind the scenes in many ways, but there's days I don't know what I'd do without her. So thank you, Hannah, for everything you do as well. Uh, the time is now. I get to introduce the wonderful Alex Keenan. Hi, Alex Keenan. Hello. How are I you? I on the button too. I'm great. I know, I know, exactly. <laughs> Uh, it's great to have you here, Alex, and uh, an opportunity today to to talk about communications and outreach a little bit about you. I have to say that on LinkedIn, okay, on LinkedIn, we're we're given this little part to kind of describe ourselves. And some people put their title there. Some people say they're looking for work or a new adventure. Yours is the best I've ever seen uh, because it says taking the ick out of public speaking. Everybody wants to take the ick out of public speaking, right? Yeah. So she does a great job, uh, does a lot of professional development, a lot of public speaking tips, of course, uh, which is wonderful that she's coming to us today um, from Stage Light Communications, uh, public speaking and communications consultant. I want to get right to it. Lots to talk about today. Is there anything you want to share about us, Alex, that uh, maybe can can kick us off in terms of your experience that uh, we can kind of sit back and go, yeah, Alex knows what she's doing. Yeah, yeah. So I um I have a weird professional background. So I, I used to practice law. I do not practice law anymore. Uh, but what I learned from that is how to persuade, how to be really clear, how to sum up a really complex point in one sentence. And so I brought that and I combined it with the uh, stuff I do uh. for fun, which is comedy, uh, and which is all about connecting with an audience, uh, getting people to pay attention, have a little bit of fun with it, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, communication, being a professional doesn't need to be boring. And so I put those two things together uh, to work with professionals uh, in the nonprofit and in the business world to make sure that they are communicating, you know, with their teams, with their their customers, with their audiences in a way that's going to be effective, that's going to feel good, that's going to yeah. help accomplish their goals. Amazing. Uh, lots to get to today. Uh, communications and outreach. Boy, I wish there was like... Um you know, a guide that was just for everybody, but everybody is so unique in this way. There's no template that's going to fit every organization. So that's why we need you, Alex. That's why today's uh, really, obviously, really important to us. I think a lot of people very um, quickly, the very first challenge I think a lot of people would have, Alex, is I don't have enough people to outreach to, or, or who am I going to, you know, who's my audience? It's very hard to sometimes define that, especially if you're a local organization and you find there's a lot of other people maybe in the space, how do you mm -hmm. find your niche? So so let's start there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, okay, so I'm going to say this a few times, uh, and it's a very it's a very lawyerly response, but the answer to just about every question is it depends. <laughs> and <laughs> so finding your audience depends on what your goals are. And so I sometimes get questions like, you know, should I should I do a big call out to a lot of people or should I reach out to the people I already know? Well, it, well, it depends. You know, mm -hmm. are you trying to do are you trying to accomplish a goal that mm -hmm. requires this mass, uh, you know, interest from the public with, you know, everyone can contribute a little bit and that's going to achieve your goals? Or do you need some people who are very, very committed, who are going to do an extraordinary amount, in which case you're going to reach out to the people that already know about you are already into what you do have already demonstrated their mm -hmm. commitment i'm sorry i'm getting a ton of messages i don't know if that uh, oh. <laughs> if those notifications are coming through i'll see if i can silence that in a second uh so it, it really it depends mm -hmm. um but uh you know you you need to figure out you know what are their goal who's in a position to help us i was actually just talking mm -hmm. to a, a group but uh, you know, just before this some of them are on this call um do they have the ability to help you or can that ability to help you be nurtured? And 
do they care? Are they motivated to help you to get involved? And you need to have both of those things. So ideally, your audience already has both of those things. Uh, but sometimes the people you need to help you need to be persuaded, motivated to, you know, to do something, or mm -hmm. they really want to, but they just need help eliminating the barriers to doing that. So you're thinking about what is my goal? Yeah. Who's going to be able to help me? First of all, first question, who can do something about it? Yeah. <laughs> or who can be given the tools to do mm -hmm. something about it? And then you go from there. And I think there's something to do. A lot of times we call that, you know, the call to action. What, what do you actually want me to do? Is it something as simple as you want me to sign a petition? Are you wanting me to donate? Are you wanting me to show up somewhere? Exactly. What action am I taking? And, and mm -hmm. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in the early days of a relationship, it's, it's kind of like getting that little mouse to come, right? So you're not wanting anybody, you know, you don't want to say to somebody, I want you to do a strategic plan for me, you know, no. getting them to come really close and exactly. uh, small bites. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if someone doesn't know you well, if they don't trust you, they mm -hmm. don't know that you have something to offer them. They're only going to be willing to put out a little bit um, to, to do a little thing for you. Um, but um, so Robert Cialdini, who is a psychology professor, um, I can't remember off the top of my head which school, but he uh, he wrote a book about the art of persuasion. And one thing that he found in his research is that if someone does one thing for you, they are more likely to do another thing for you. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get someone to help a little bit, then you can go back to them and say, hey, remember remember when, when you did this? Uh, we would love if you would also be involved in this. And you can build the the strength of their inputs over time mm -hmm. when they, you know, they feel like, oh, I'm, I'm invested in this. I'm part of this movement. I'm part of this community. Oh, yeah, I'll give a little more. I'll give a little more. I'll give a little mm -hmm. more because mm -hmm. they feel more rewarded for doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, you need to you need to work them up. That. Yeah. And I think there's a moment and I, you know, once again, it's different for everybody, but I think there's a moment where people feel like you're on the bus now you're, you know, you're, you're mm -hmm. not just riding beside them, you know, maybe, um, you know, giving a donation or, um, or signing a petition or doing some sort of action, but you're actually on the bus. And that moment you're on the bus in terms of a cause, you become even more invested. You actually, you want to bring more people on the bus with you, yeah. and get more people on the bus. Yeah. 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 That's, I love that analogy. Yeah. And we're, we're a social species. We want people to come along with us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So calls to action, give us some samples of ones that you, that you have found to be quite, uh, quite uh, successful. Mm, okay. Uh, well, so again, it depends where it depends where they are. Um, you know, um, we had a conversation earlier today about, uh, you know, when you're, when you're making a social media post, you want it to be quick, you want it to be direct, you want it to be punchy. But you also don't want to be misleading. You want to give people mm. all the information. So sometimes maybe you just need to have a link. Hey, click here to read more. Right. Um, and with, with the changes on meta, that is harder. You can't just link to your article anymore. But there, there are ways around that. You can. Someone mentioned uh, in the meeting we had earlier today, um, mm -hmm. you can put it in the comment. Here's, here's the link to what we're talking about. Right. So mm -hmm. click here to learn more. The mm -hmm. people who want to learn more will click. The people mm -hmm. who don't will keep scrolling. They're not your audience. Um, other ones that, that can be really effective. Hey, share this with a friend. <laughs> um, people like to to share, um, you know, things that they think other people will like. For some of us, um, it's a way of, of showing affection. Hey, I saw mm -hmm. this thing. It made me think of you. Here it is, right? Um, yeah. come, to, come to our free event. Yes. Yeah, come, and, come and meet us. Yeah. Here's a thing that here's a thing to do on your weekend. <laughs> um, yeah. What else? Uh, so and then when you get people who are you know a little bit a little bit higher in their investment in it, it can be um, you know um, hey come come volunteer with us at this mm -hmm. event. Um, mm -hmm. Sign up you know sign up for yeah. our newsletter and find out about the action the opportunities to take action. Um, send a letter to your elected representatives. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, even easier if, if you actually have, you know, some text. Mm -hmm. that they yeah. can say. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes it's hard to think of well, what, what would I say to my MP? Yeah. But if you have something yeah. that they can use yeah. to express themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And then they can personalize it if they want to. Exactly. Kind of yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I think, too, you know, you've you've touched on something where it's time, talent and treasure, really. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the, the trifecta of, of philanthropy, ironically. And philanthropy, yeah. 
I think a lot of people think of philanthropy as just money and it's not. Yeah. Right. It's, it's right. exactly what you just said. It's volunteering. It's, it's getting on a board. It's uh, you know, all of these, it's maybe it's walking around some sort of literature to a community. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. those are all forms of philanthropy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, talking about things like, like getting on a board um, when you get into those, those more intensive calls to action, it helps for those to be personalized. You know, one, one mistake that I see happen quite often is, hey, we, we want people to, you know, to join our board. So we're just going to send out an e- a blast, right? Identify specific people mm-hmm. that you think would be good on that board and send them something personalized. If you want them on your committee, send a personalized thing. Hey, I think you mm-hmm. would be really good at it. It does take more time, but you're mm-hmm. going to get a much higher intake rate because if it's if it's just a mass email, it's mm-hmm. safe to ignore, right? If someone writes to you personally, you feel like, you know, they, they've yeah. done something they've invested in you and you want you want to invest back at least to respond and say hey you know it's not the right time for me but people are more likely to respond they're more likely to say yes um like oh you thought of me for that i never thought that i would have the skills for that but if you think so then maybe i'll try it right and yeah. so those bigger asks you know see if you can personalize them personalize them that's a great tip for sure and and the audience that we're talking about and you know it, it's so hard uh, and it's not lost on me that, you know, people with really big budgets probably don't feel it as difficult uh, a, sh- a challenge as maybe the smaller organizations we have with us today, but really finding our own our own space uh, in a in a very, very crowded world with social media, everything's coming at us. I mean, I look around here and I can see about five logos and I'm just in my own office. Yeah, you know, it's everywhere. Right. So yeah. I think uh, it can be hard for people to to kind of find their find their space. Any advice there? Mm. Well, I think the the key thing is what makes you different from the other people who are doing similar things. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it is that you are working, you know, say you you have two organizations that work on climate change, uh, mm-hmm. and one of them is about political action, one of them is about cultural change, right? What is making you different from them? Maybe it's your audience. Uh, you know, we target, you know, our our core demographic is youth. And we're going to speak to the things that, that youth are talking about. We're going to go to the places where you spend their time, the platforms where you spend their time. We're going to use the language that youth are using. Others are uh, you know, seniors, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to you know, go to the places where seniors spend their time. We are going to use their language. Um, so what is distinctive about your, your niche? And if you don't have one, maybe you need to start carving one out. Who is mm-hmm. not being spoken to in this conversation? And how can you go to where they are and start speaking to them? Um, and when you are figuring out that audience, uh, you need to be you need to be observing and preferably talking <laughs> to that group and having them represented in your leadership, uh, so that you know that the efforts that you're making are actually meaningful for that group, um, mm-hmm. and uh, that what you're saying is being heard. When we think about communications and a communications plan, I mean. You don't have to tell anybody that hasn't been through the co- through COVID mm-hmm. how quickly we had to, um, you know, obviously pivot. I hate that word. Oh my gosh, I, I used it, but I really do. I don't <laughs> like it. Um, but how quickly we had to pivot. So it's one thing right. to sort of have a, a communications plan and who you're going to reach out to, but but it is important to be fluid, right? Yeah, yeah. And just speaking about pivoting, I know um, in the early days of the pandemic, I felt like I was pivoting so often, I was just spinning around in a circle. Um, so there, there is being fluid, being able to to notice signals in the environment and respond, okay, you know, what we're doing isn't working. Mm-hmm. People aren't listening, people aren't responding, people aren't engaging. What do we need to adjust? What do we need to learn? And then do a little bit differently? Uh I think the key thing for nonprofit in the nonprofit space, especially, is we still have a mission. You know, we still have the thing that we are aiming to accomplish. And if we pivot too hard, we're going to be facing in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. And so, so how do you stick with that mission, and and keep telling that you know, that core story, but just kind of tweak tweak the way you're telling it, tweak who you're telling it to, mm-hmm. um, you know, tweak where you're going to tell mm-hmm. it, you know. So where, what are people paying attention to and where are they? Where are they looking? Go there <laughs> and wave your arms. <laughs> yeah. And I think those opportunities to actually physically be in front of people, those mm. were lost for so long, but now we're seeing, you know, whether it be different clubs being opened again, different speaking opportunities, it could be at a, 
you know, a philanthropy fair or a volunteer fair, and you get to share your message, mm -hmm. uh, give us some, some tips on, on how we can communicate verbally that will maybe stand out from others as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, okay. Um, one thing that I, I think is so helpful, and this is, you know, me coming from, from my nerdy improv background, but the <laughs> idea of yes and, right? So so when you are having a conversation with someone, um, a, a client that I had in the past gave me this quote that I think is so perfect. It's people don't support you because they understand you. They support you because they feel like you understand them. So the first thing, you're having a conversation with someone that you've just met in an environment like, you know, an event where you get to, to talk to people. The first thing is to ask them questions about themselves, about what they care about, about what their concerns are. So you understand where they're coming from. And then you can speak to them in those terms. And then we bring the idea of yes and, which is you take what someone has given you. You don't say no, you don't argue, you don't push back. I mean, so, sometimes you got to push back, right? Like some, some ideas are just bad. But in general, um, you know, if you're generally on the same page, um, you can say, yeah, and and here's what we're doing about that concern mm -hmm. that you have. Um, yes, and I think you might have a lot of fun with this program. Uh, you know, yes, and, you know, uh, we would love to have you as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. We'd love to have you join this meeting and share what you just shared to us. So you're you're finding what they care about, what they're looking for, and saying, all right, yeah, so so here's mm -hmm. how you can be involved, mm -hmm. given what you just told right. me. Yeah. It's great. And, and a great question, which I, I don't want to lose it, So uh, because I know we're going to take some questions later, but you were talking a little bit earlier about different language. Um, so the question is, can you give us an example of the different language you would use to communicate with youth versus seniors? I know this is a big one right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. <laughs> It depends. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think, first of all, those of us who are, are not youth anymore should avoid trying to mm -hmm. to speak you speak because it, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it. I mean, think about when you when you were a teenager and your yeah. parents tried to use your slang, you know, just don't. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it's useful to look at you know, what are people talking about say in online spaces if you're thinking about you um what are they talking about what are the concerns that they're expressing um what what is the language and the concepts that they're throwing around um and and understanding you know the way that they think about it the way that they they talk about it um you know there's so much out there at least at least in the spheres where where i spend some of my time online of uh, youth are concerned about injustice right mm -hmm. youth are very very concerned about injustice um they're scared for their futures because they don't know if they'll ever be able to own a home uh you know they're dealing with uh increasing pressures from employers uh and the same companies that are exploiting them are exploiting the, the planet right and so you know the, the youth who are really engaged in these things this is the language they're talking it's the language of justice Primarily, you know, they, they've grown up in an uh, in an era of, of social justice, of um, increased awareness of um, of social issues, of, you know, of, of racism and sexism and, you know, a lot of the isms. And they're, they're just very aware. And so being aware of that language and being able to speak it um, clearly is, is really helpful uh, with youth, uh, with seniors. It depends. Um, <laughs> but um a lot of, you know, a lot of seniors are looking for community and are looking for um, ways to contribute to a legacy, right? Um, you know, uh, they may be retired, are looking for ways to, you know, to stay engaged with people, to continue to be social, to contribute the skills that they contributed in the workforce um, to, you know, in other ways. And so it's really finding ways to, to help them feel that their contributions are meaningful. Mm hmm yeah, really important. And, and the language is, is very different. And, you know, when I think about uh, when I'm sending any sort of donor communications or stewardship, I often will, will let my mom read it. You know, she's 82. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. You know, what do you think of this? Um, and, you know, I, I don't pretend to be able to, to write for different audiences when I can tap into different audiences. I, I, I want to do that. Right. So. right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of the ways that communication is done now that we kind of take for granted 
is is very foreign to people who didn't grow up with that. And so it is helpful to run it by someone from mm-hmm. you know from older generations. Does this even make sense to you? Yeah. You know, I tried once to explain to my grandfather what I do for a living and it it made no sense to him. Right? <laughs> and so, yeah. so how do how do we, you know, explain these concepts in a way that that is aligned with, you know, yeah. the way that people have lived their lives and the way they see the world. Can we talk about storytelling for a minute? Because I sure. think uh, this is this word has been bantered around a lot, whether it be in in comms or in, in fundraising. And I think a lot of people have almost become scared of it they're you know they think their story is not big enough or you know they don't don't have a you know I don't have a story to tell um I hear that a lot from my clients and then when I sort of dig deep they're like oh we do have stories so talk to me a little bit about the importance of storytelling Mm, okay I first I want to say there used to be this show on tv called everybody's got a story oh and yeah it was it was so wonderful they would go to they would open up you know a an atlas of the United States and yeah. point to a random page, go to that town. No. They would open up the phone book in that town, find a random person, call them and say, we want to do a, a mini documentary about your story. And if the person said yes, they would tell that person's story. It didn't matter who that person was once it was a five-year-old child. No. And way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they, you know, yeah. they would sit down and, and meet this person and find out about their life. And so over and over and over again, you know, they would show the finished product to the person. And I didn't realize that I had a story worth telling, but this is amazing. Uh, so, yeah. So I think we, we all do. Um, and it doesn't need to be dramatic. It doesn't need to be extraordinary. Um, but we all have things that we care about that other people can relate to, right? Um, I mean, for everyone who's seen the Barbie movie, you know, ordinary Barbie, <laughs> right? Yeah. I would, yeah. I would buy an ordinary Barbie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can relate to ordinary Barbie. That's so, um, so, um, so, so it's about it's about what people can connect to, not necessarily mm-hmm. um, something that is going to leave them in awe, right? Because because that emotional connection that they have to what you're doing is what's going to be most powerful. Yeah. And so it's really thinking about, you know, what are you doing? Why does it matter? Mm-hmm. Right. Why does it matter to people outside of yourself? Um, you know, are you are you saving um, this wilderness area that, you know, that people camped in as a kid? Right. Um, mm-hmm. Are you you know, are you making sure that. Um, that, you know, we have we have clean drinking water. Right. Is there a story about, you know, a storm that devastated, you know, your home um, or, you know, all like all of these things we all have stories my parents in Nova Scotia have had fires and floods and fires and floods this year right people can relate to that we understand why it's important um so yeah so it's it's really about kind of creating a narrative and I think we think about stories like oh it has to you know like follow this flow and then there's you know the 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 hero you know denies the journey and then the other mentor comes and then you know it doesn't have to follow that hero's journey thing necessarily it's about creating a narrative it's about creating an idea Mm-hmm. an idea about what is happening in the world and what matters yeah and if we I think that's going to be sorry yeah sorry to talk over you oh no, no go for it. I, was just say, I think that's going to be a relief to people because I think mm-hmm. they think they need the Disney arc yeah call it, right the Disney arc they don't need the Disney arc and sometimes um you know I worked at the Ottawa mission for many many years and you know some of the direct mail pieces that were the best were were really me just sitting down with somebody that had a story to tell. And I use the exact language, although grammatically it wasn't correct or anything like that. It didn't matter. Those people related to them because they could either see themselves in that story by the grace of God, there go I, or they knew someone that had struggled that way. And so I think the more authentic storytelling, there's the word authentic, authentic storytelling, um, because certainly from my perspective, when I think about fundraising, the big ideas have never really come when we all sit together and go, okay, we're going to meet at two o'clock on a Tuesday. The big mm-hmm. ideas come when you're like driving down the street or, you know, uh, you experience something um, and you think, oh, no, that's, that needs to be told. I think that's the yes. difference, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The stories come um, and it, you, you can think about, you know, if you're, if you're just sitting around chatting with someone either, you know, at work or, at you know having friends over for dinner what are you know what are the stories that you gravitate towards and what's the what's the meaning behind them yeah 
hundred percent. Can we talk about outreach for a second? Cause I think a lot of people, of course, everybody thinks I want a bigger audience. You know, yeah. we, we want lots of people. And I say to my clients, I'd love to know what you say. I love to, I say to my clients all the time because they worry about, Oh, if we do that, people are going to unsubscribe or people aren't going to be engaged anymore. And I actually say to them, that's okay. That I would rather you have a hundred, a thousand, 10,000, whatever it is, people that want to be on your list than have a hundred thousand people that are not interested in you because mm. it's a big waste of time and money. I think when somebody unsubscribes from a list, that's not a bad thing. It means you won't be sending them something in the future. It means that their priorities have shifted and it doesn't mean they won't come back yeah. to you. Yeah. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about, about that concept and, and maybe mm. I'm wrong, but that's what I think. Uh, no, I agree with you. And I've, I've heard the concept expressed as true fans. People who, oh, actually, you know, people who actually care about what you're doing and are, are going to get something back, yes. right? And they're the people you want to be speaking to. And I think, um, you know, if you were going to say something meaningful, you're going to risk turning off people who see the world differently. Like mm-hmm. we just, we all see the world differently. We have different things that we care about. Uh, we have different things that we trust. We have different things that we believe to be true about the world. And mm-hmm. that's just, that's just a fact of living in a society with, billions of people um Mm -hmm. we're not all going to see the world the same way and we're not all going to want to hear the same messages and so the people who care about your message and you know want to keep following want to keep hearing from you um you got to give them something real and you got to give them something juicy and that Mm -hmm. real juicy stuff is going to turn some people off but Mm -hmm. it's going to deepen the engagement of the people of of, you know your people Mm -hmm. your your posse Mm -hmm. (laughs) um and so it's like, it, it's a trade off and it's, um, it's actually a, an investment in your audience and building that relationship with them. Um, cause if you're afraid to say anything real, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're going to get bored. They're not going to invest in you. What's the biggest mistake people make when it comes to outreach in your mind? Oh, the biggest mistake. Um, I think the biggest mistake people make is saying, I've got to be on this platform. I've got to be on this platform. I've got to be on this platform. I've got to be on this because they're big, right? And I got to, you know, I got to be pushing stuff out. But are your people there? Right? Are you wasting your time? You know, I'm talking about the difference between youth and seniors. Um, youth aren't on Facebook because mm-hmm. that's where their parents hang out. Mm-hmm. Some seniors are on TikTok, but I would say it's probably not the majority. <laughs> um, so are you going to, to where people spend their time Mm -hmm. um and are you kind of removing the barriers for them um and i think i think barriers is is a really key concept um and maybe the biggest mistake is is ignoring the barriers right um so you know we think okay if you build it they will come right but if you build it and then you go out there and let people know that it exists and then you build a relationship with them and you let them know how to, you get them direction so they can get there and you tell them why it's interesting right um and you you know you make them feel like their interests are being considered um a certain percentage of them will come right but it's you know what's stopping them from getting there you know um is it i mean you know in, in this metaphorical space like you know is field of dreams on a, on a dirt road that everybody's car gets broken down on right is there is there a public transit to it um when you're talking about your message like do you have a clear way to um get to your uh, your website does your website have contact information on it does your website tell people clearly what you do or is it this wall of text that's really confusing um right. if they call your office are they going to get a human being um you know uh, are you asking them to call your office when they are uh they're youth who don't like getting on phone calls, right. <laughs> you know, do you have different ways for people to get in touch with you depending on their preferences? Uh, and so think about what are all like the barriers that can get in the way of people getting in touch with us, deepening their involvement. Mm-hmm. How do we get rid of those barriers? Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of one of the first things you need to be thinking about. Yeah. And do you find it hard when, when we have a communications piece, whether it be, you know, something going to, to supporters, uh, could be an annual report, whatever it is. And, and there's too many cooks in the kitchen. Mm. Has that been something you've, you've seen? Cause I know sometimes I always, you know, sort of talk about 
different projects with my clients. And I always warn them. I'm like, we don't want to come out with a platypus, right? So we don't want to come out with uh, something that suits everybody else's needs. But when we put it all together, it just doesn't suit anybody. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where you need to have everybody on the same page. Like, you're not writing this document for you. Right. right? You're, you're writing it for mm -hmm. your stakeholders and, and preferably for a particular segment of your stakeholders. Um, because, you know, you're probably going to talk to your funders a different way that you talk to your volunteers. And you're going to talk to your volunteers a different way that you talk to, you know, the political players that, that you work with on an advocate in an advocacy role. Um, so who is it for? What did they need to hear? Not what do you want them to know, but what did they need to hear? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it, it takes a little bit of discipline. Maybe it takes someone owning that document and, and making some mm -hmm. difficult calls. And they have to say, you know what, yeah. that, that, that's great information. I think it's it's more useful for this group. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna yeah. create a separate document. We'll put the, put the page on the website and we can send yeah. our funders there, you know, but this, this is, you know, yeah. for our members, right? Um, and I and find it's helped to have a boilerplate. Yes. Um, that yep. allows people to uh, sort of have um, have something at the end of a document or whatever that mm -hmm. kind of does the mandate stuff where you don't have to yep. put that in every comms. Can you talk a little bit? Maybe that's a new term for some people today. Can you talk a little bit about boilerplate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Boilerplate is basically it's just it's just a template. It's, you know, you can pull it out time and time again and just use it over and over again. It's, you know, um, your mission and it's a document with your mission and vision on it. You know, copy paste. Here's our mission and vision. Um Every year we've got our, our annual report. We've got a message from our chair. We've got, uh, you know, a little paragraph about our projects. We've got, you know, a little section about, you know, uh, an infographic with our impact. And we just copy paste these. We change the details from year to year. And, you know, nobody has to reinvent the annual report every single year. Mm -hmm. It's also, it's a good branding exercise. People open it up year after year. It looks yeah. consistent. Exactly. So they know who put this out. And I think, um, you know, branding is and consistency is, is also a big challenge for, for nonprofits, especially, you know, you have an, in, uh, an intern uh, who comes in and does communications for six months and then you run out of funding for them. You get someone else come in and they're, they're using different fonts. They're using different style in everything that they do. And it's just a mishmash. And people look at that and they don't know what organization does this come from. So mm -hmm. having a very clear um, style and preferably a style guide, right? When we put out communication, these are the colors that we use. These are the fonts that we use. <laughs> um, this is the language that we use to talk about what we do. These are things that we do not talk about um, because either it's outside of our mission, um, you know, we consider it inappropriate, uh, you know, whatever, um, and have like, this guide that people can follow. So it's consistent. People see you on social media. They see your annual report. They go, oh, that's this organization. I like them. <laughs> yeah. I'll continue reading. Yeah. And even more important, I think when we are smaller groups, when we are a smaller organization, that we have that, that you know, that recognizability in terms of, mm. of, you know, oh, we know that that's Ecology Ottawa, or we know that that's, uh, yeah. you know, CBI, for instance. I mean, I think that's, mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important. We're getting ready for your questions, everyone. So we want to see those questions in the Q&A. Uh, Alex has uh, got lots of experience. We want to tap into all of that today. Um, so we're taking your questions in a couple of minutes, but just before we get to uh, get to the questions of of our lovely uh, participants today, um, Alex, what do you think in terms of you know when when we think about trying to combine fundraising and outreach, are we trying to do too much? I mean, probably, but what other choice do we have? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but I think um, what we want to avoid doing is trying to mash everything up together in all ways at all times. Mm -hmm. um, there are people you can fundraise from and there are people you're talking to for different purposes. Uh, and if you try to ask people for money too soon, mm -hmm. you're going to turn them off. Everyone wants their money. <laughs> um, and we only have so much of it. Um, so I think outreach should be first and foremost relationship building mm. once and I, I'm going to defer to you too Sam because you you do the fundraising stuff you know I do I do, I do the communication stuff yeah. and, and you know they overlap but you know they're different they're different areas first and foremost you need to be building a relationship you need to have their trust 
before you start asking them to open up their wallets. Mm -hmm. um, so that should be kind of the primary focus of your communication is meeting people, building relationships with them, getting them to a place in that relationship where you can start asking them for stuff. Yeah. And, and a lot of people call that friend raising. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. So, you know, so friend raising, uh, yeah. as opposed to fundraising, um, mm -hmm. bringing people a little bit closer. I think um, those that are blessed with, you know, very big branding and, and budgets can kind of get away with, um, with maybe that ask a little bit sooner. But if you're trying to get that sustainable group, because the, the last thing I think we want, whether it be, you know, a, a, a gift that's fundraised, whether it be some sort of connection to an organization, we don't want it to be one off, right? No, no, we want exactly. them to be lasting, right? And you've yeah. mentioned, you know, sustainability, fundraising, um, fundraising for myself, but you've talked about relationship building. I think all of that um, is, is really, really key in moving forward is, mm. uh, is to really tap into the opportunity for that sustainability as well. Yeah. 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 I've also heard the term fundraising, which I really like. Oh, I love that. Yeah. If you can, tell people, you know, yeah. sometimes it's, we're going to have an event. It's just going to be fun. Um, sometimes it's, you can tickle someone's funny bone and they, you know, they will spend money just because they like it. So years ago, someone started a GoFundMe to make potato salad. They wanted $15 to make potato salad. They raised thousands because people thought this was so funny. They donated to this crowdfunding for a potato salad, just even though it you know, had clearly exceeded what the person was trying to raise. Um, people just, this is funny. I'm just gonna throw them a few dollars. And I think the person did donate the money to charity. Um, yeah. <laughs> but that's awesome. People just, they thought it was fun. So yeah. they, you know, they were willing to uh, just contribute yeah. a little bit just to be part of this thing. Yeah. Uh, with Let's take people. that to the next level. I mean, I know you do comedy. I do comedy. Is mm. there a place for humor in outreach and communications? Absolutely. 100%. Uh, you know, we're going back to authenticity. Most of us have a sense of humor, uh, you know, and, and it, it doesn't hurt to share. I mean, as long, you know, as long as it's consistent with the values of your organization, Absolutely. Have a little bit of fun. Um, and it's a great way to expand your audience as well. Going back to this, you know, you like to, you, you see something that you like, you think your friend will like, you share it. I have a couple friends on Instagram. We just, all day, we just send each other funny <laughs> things on Instagram. Yeah. Back and yeah. forth. We don't have conversations. We just send funny things to each other. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, you have something that is, is fun. It's entertaining. People will share it with their friends. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that's how you grow your audience. Right. You know, and, and then the, the friend sees it and they think it's funny, but they're also interested in what you have to say. They go, Oh, these yeah. seem like people, uh, you know, and then they look more into you. And it's a great way to, you know, just kind of organically grow your audience by, by being a fun person. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Personality. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The only two people I have met uh, that don't have a sense of humor are both husbands, uh, ex-husbands. <laughs> But yes, absolutely. Uh, we've got lots of people here today. Samuel's here, Rachel, Nicholas, Nicole, Michelle, Lindsay, Lee, uh, Ked and Cass, Jesse, Jasmine, Jade, Jacqueline, Haley, Eleanor, Christine, Cheryl, Ben, and Ada. Lots of people here. I'm hoping um, that I've inspired you now that I've reached out with your name uh, to uh, to send us a question in the chat. We're always welcome uh, to uh, to answer those questions. I know you love answering audience questions as well. Uh, you had a great session today. Uh, any any little gems that came out of today's session, Alex, that you want to share with us today? Oh, uh, yeah. So today we were um, we were talking about uh, you know kind of identifying a certain segment of your audience. Um, so you know you have a goal that you need to accomplish. Uh, you're looking for a group of people and get as specific as possible with this group of people um, about you know like. Mm -hmm. who, who are the people who are in a position to help you, basically, who are in a position to help you achieve this goal. And, you know, know who they are, know where they spend their time, know what they're interested in, know what makes them go, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and want to learn more and go there and do that thing and talk to them that way. And one thing that I like to do um, is uh, think about like, you know, potato head, right? That old toy that we all play with as a kid, right? Um, Put a face on that potato head. Put an outfit on that potato head. 
you know, um, put, put something in their hand. Um, one person today didn't just do that. They, they had a whole setting for their potato head. Their potato head was in a library. <laughs> um, so, so how do we, we create this image of this person that we're trying to reach, really understand them? If you realize you don't really understand them, then your goal is to go out and find out about them, go and start talking to them, learn about what they like, learn about what they care about, uh, what they're willing to support. And then you use that to create your strategy for talking to them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're like me. I collect like, oh man, I really want to show you the pile because it's here. Uh, it's like this tall. Um, but I collect communications and and direct mail pieces and annual reports and mm. capital campaign material. I'm always looking to see what other people are doing to, to inspire me. And sometimes if I'm, you know, I look and I've got a blank computer staring back at me, I'll pull someone else's stuff out. And I know it's not, I'm not trying to steal anything. It's meant to, it's meant to just kind of inspire me. Do you, do you do yeah. that? Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, I have, I, I, some people call it a swipe file and it's just, okay. here's the thing that I thought was well done. I'm going to put it in a folder. Yeah. Uh, and then when yeah. I'm looking for inspiration, I'll go back and like, how can I apply this principle mm -hmm. to the work that I do or the work that my client is doing? Yeah. Yeah. And you're not copying what they did. You're just, this is a cool yeah. idea. How could I make it my own? Yeah. 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 What do you think people are most surprised about in terms of outreach this, these days? Is it, is it how difficult it is? Is it is it the retention of people? What what do you think it is? Mm, that is a great question. What are they most surprised about? Um, I think what kind of consistently surprises people over and over again is again coming back to this idea of if you build it, they won't necessarily come. Mm. Um, and you need to be consistent you need to be repetitive and you know sometimes we worry you know we don't we don't want to be you know telling people the same story over and over again you don't want to repeat yourself um, and in your personal life that's fine right uh you know my my partner will tell me when I've already told him this story before <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but when you are doing outreach you are competing with so many other people who are also speaking people might see what you're putting out there but then they forget or they, you, they get the email from you and they're like, oh, I'll respond to that later. But then they don't. So you don't have to be afraid to repeat yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every single day. We have to have brand new content on social media every single day. Oh, if no one responded to that email, then we're sunk, right? Send a follow-up email. Send another follow-up email. Hey, you know, just want to, you know, in case, yeah. in case you missed it the first time, here's this event we're having. Please sign up. Oh, our event is tonight. Have you signed up yet? You know, right? Um, yeah, share stuff multiple times in, you know, with multiple configurations. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every single day and you don't have the resources usually. I think I needed to hear that today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I think, I think often I do get in that, you know, oh, I'm not, you know, I haven't, uh, you know, I need something fresh when, when really, um, you know, it's, it's because it, we often hear about advertising, it takes somebody six times to remember it once. Yeah. So I think yeah. that principle we sometimes forget in the pressure to always create in this spirit of social media now and the, and the pressure to, to always be, be fresh, yeah. um, but fresh can be new again too. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We need to see it multiple times before it, it registers. And most people didn't see it the first time. Right. 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 So if you were feeling uninspired go back and look at your old stuff and just repurpose some old stuff yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe you look back and realize oh you know our intern put the wrong font on that I'm gonna I'm gonna refresh it with you know yeah. with, with our font and our colors push it out again yeah right. yeah do you have a favorite campaign that you've done a favorite slogan a favorite oh uh, success story mm. that's a big question yeah yeah <laughs> You can always come back to it too. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that I, that I did, which was, um, you know, sort of comms related, but also fundraising is that I, I, I gave people different options on, you know, they could give, you know, this much money to mental health, this much money to financial help, this much money to housing. But then yeah. I put an additional one that said, or you can give to all. Do you yeah. know the majority of people give to all? Right. So that was something I just tested once. 
Mm. And people, so it's different levels. So I think it's like, you know, $29, $54 and, you know, 76 bucks. I can't remember, but something like that. Mm. And then I added them all up and whatever that is, the total comes to 204. Cause I always remember it comes to 204, but the total is, is 204. And so I say that because that was a risk that I took in a small sort of test and yeah. it's okay to test stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's absolutely. a good example of how like, then the checks started to come in and they were for $204. Right. Yeah. The fundraising example, but from a communications perspective, you know, giving, giving people, you know, an option to do something where I'm going to sign this petition, but I'm also going to send it to my friend Mm -hmm. um, and put it in the same sort of piece. You know, that's something that might be fresh for someone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is something that marketers do all the time. And Mm -hmm. if it's a risk and you're not sure how it's going to go, you can do what's called A-B testing, which is we're going to do it, you know, the old way for half of the audience. We're going to do it this new way for half and see what happens. We'll compare our results yeah. um, and, you know, and maybe we'll learn something. Maybe it doesn't work and then we know, but maybe it does. And then next time we can do them all this way. Yeah. Um, we've got lots of, uh, lots of people still with us here. Oh, Eleanor's just sent a question. Do you have any advice for planning content? where there are multiple demands. So she's given some examples, mm. funder requirements, fundraising needs, holiday special days, and then she's got end limited time. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. yeah, yeah. So um, the ultimate scenario is when different audiences are on different platforms. So you can be on LinkedIn and you're talking to your project partners or your funders on LinkedIn. And then you're talking to, um, you know, uh, the, the people who come to your events on Facebook or whatever. Um, and so you can totally have different messaging on both of those. Um, if you are not in that optimal scenario, um, you can say, um, Hey, this group of people, right? So people know, oh, oh, they're talking to me, right? right. Um, so you, you can get people's attention right away. Oh, this is for me. And people love when it's for them. Yeah. Um, and if it's not for them, you know, they just keep scrolling, whatever. Um, yeah. Basically, yeah. So so think about, you know, are there a few pieces of content that you can share specifically with this audience? You know, whoever you need to reach right now, talk to them and let them know that you're talking to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, for, for holidays, special days, I mean, I think those are, those are nice to do. Don't mm-hmm. feel like you have to mark every special day. I think there are some that, you know, as a, a nonprofit, you are expected yes. to, to observe, yeah. but, but you like, don't, yeah. Have, yeah, every day. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, yeah. Exactly. You don't have to have every single. You know, hallelujah. Can I just yeah. say hallelujah <laughs> to you? Cause no, I think no, there's a lot yeah. of pressure to like mark cookie day and smile day. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. I think it's like, it's, it's, there's a very important day coming up, for instance, on September the 30th. I think that day, uh, which is Truth and Reconciliation Day, that takes some thoughtful mm-hmm. uh, planning. I think that's a really important day. You've got Giving Tuesday, which might be important if you're trying to raise money. Yeah. Um, you've got, if you're dealing with, you know, um, uh, the environment, obviously, Earth Day, you know, I mean, there's certain things that obviously are going to make mm. sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that would be, yeah, I think that would be an important message to send. I, there's a lot of people going right now, Alex, there's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. me yeah. might be yeah. one of them, but yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you don't need to do all of the things all the time. A lot of our work, it goes in, you know, in a cyclical way. And so you have giving Tuesday. So maybe those six weeks, you're focusing a lot on giving Tuesday and that kind of messaging of, you know, give back, uh, you know, the holidays are coming like generosity, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe um, a certain time of year, you are really working hard on a project and you just want to let people know about that project. And so most of what you're doing for outreach can be focused around that. That's where your energy is. It's where your attention is. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just, just focus on that and don't worry about, Oh, we have to be, you know, doing your fundraising emails, you know, yeah. in between. Um, you know, what's, what's happening at that time what's what's yeah. big what's you know in people's attention and just yeah. focus on that um and you can yeah you can repurpose content <laughs> yeah, sure. you can repurpose content say the same thing three different ways right and the lovely <laughs> the lovely it, absolutely the lovely hannah part of our trio today is uh got something great in the in the uh chat here saying regarding social media using a platform such as later or canva that you can pre-schedule posts and to keep it consistent, but saves you time overall. I love Canva, by the way. 
love Canva. Mm. Oh yeah. Um, oh. This way you can pre-plan, create content ahead of time. It's relevant to your organization. Bingo. That's great. Uh, any other, we've just got about a minute left. Any other sort of resources that you want to share with us? Anything else that we're going to, we're going to love? Um, so one thing that I use, I have, uh, I have an assistant in my business who helps me with, you know, my social media because I don't, I don't want to spend my day on yeah. social media. <laughs> you know, I, I need to market, but I don't want to spend yeah. it. And so we have just, um, we just have a spreadsheet that we've created. Mm. Um, and you know, we have themes and it's color coded. So if I have to do something, it's green. If she needs to do something, it's purple. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, I will create a video and then I, you know, put, you know, other cells like she needs to share this video other places and every day you know it's like here's what mm -hmm. i have to do here's what right. stephanie needs to do uh, mm -hmm. and you can do so much with just a simple spreadsheet yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. one of the most powerful tools available to you yeah, absolutely um, you know, very clear at a at a glance every day what do i need to do today yeah and hannah's adding here too canva pro is free yes. for incorporated nonprofits. yay so that's wonderful a uh, great bonus there for everyone I have enjoyed my time with you so much. It always goes by so fast. I cannot believe it's been an hour. Mm -hmm. I promised you at the top that I could, I could talk an ear off an elephant. Uh, so I was like, I need to watch my time because I could talk to Alex all night long. Yep. Um, but you're so easy to chat with and lots of great tips today. I, I even took some away that I think are uh, really important. And um, I'm hoping um, that uh, people uh, that joined us today, participants today, also made their own list of of Alex uh, of Alex wisdom and uh, uh, lots of thank yous coming in. So really appreciate uh, your time always, Alex. Alex Keenan joining us today and sharing all that great information regarding communications and outreach. I'm Sam LaPrade. I love being with you every single month. It's a pleasure and an honor. A big thank you as well to the rock behind our organization, the one and only Hannah Rockburn. Thank you so much, Hannah. We appreciate it. Lots of people wanted to uh, join us tonight. Couldn't be here. That's okay. It's recorded, right, Hannah? Yep, it's recorded. So we're good to go. Uh, I'm Sam LaPrade. Appreciate everyone joining us. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Take care.